I remember this gang fight started happening during our set. <laughs> and we were just kind of like, they were fucking garbage cans getting thrown across the room and shit. And we're like, kind of <laughs> like, what the fuck is going on? Like, and and our set, like some dude came up to us at the end. He's like, you guys fucking suck. And we're like <laughs> throwing fucking like garbage cans and shit. And we're like, let's get the fuck out of here. This is awful. <laughs> what the fuck? That's yeah. wild. <laughs> just, just just a typical night to little show, you know? You throw around a couple of trash cans, belittle the artists on stage, you know? That's just like Welcome to the 48th episode of the Cast at Ends Creation. I'm your host, Chris Deering. This is the show where I interview bands and public figures in the Mathcore and Mathcore adjacent communities. If you beautiful people in chat have any questions or comments, feel free to drop them in. I'll try to read them aloud. If you like the sub for five bucks, you get access to some exclusive emotes as well as access to the interviews before they hit YouTube and streaming services. Uh, you can also subscribe for free by attaching your Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account. It's like taking five bucks from Jeff Bezos' pocket and putting it into mine. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, listening to this in your car, and have no idea what I'm talking about, the show is first recorded live on Twitch. Join us every Sunday and Wednesday at twitch.tv slash the cast at creation for the live cast. With that out of the way, let me introduce our guest tonight who dropped one of the most le- who, I'm sorry, who was one of the most legendary acts in the genre. Welcome in Ellie, or Eli Litwin and Joe Capra of Knife the Glitter. How are you guys doing? Good. Pretty good, man. <laughs> What the hell of an intro, right? Intro. <laughs> yeah. Getting, getting better and better. It's a mouthful. <laughs> you're, like micro, you're almost a micro machine, man. <laughs> almost. Uh, so tell us who you are, what you did in the band. Drums. <laughs> All <Right>. More drums. <laughs> I am drums. <laughs> uh, I sang in the band, or I just mostly yelled. But yeah, I sang. Towards the end, I sang more. Did you actually sing? I didn't hear any uh, cleans. Yeah, yes. well, I don't know. There's there's a bunch of stuff later that we were working on when I was in the band that came after Breakfast Time that never got really released. Really? And, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to do that. I'm actually trying to get Kevin to find the WAV files of those sessions because uh, I want to release it on Bandcamp because I think that people who are fans and followed us either when we had a singer or when we were instrumental would find it really interesting because it's Joe's vocals on songs that ended up on the full length, which is instrumental. Oh, interesting. And I think it's Joe's best vocal performance. Yeah, well, we'll get to talk about that, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, honestly, for me, Breakfast Time is like one of my like seminal uh, recordings to listen to. It's it's a huge influence on me. Uh, I'm really glad you guys decided to come on. This this is great. Awesome, cool, man. I had no that. idea. <laughs> yeah, we we honestly no. <laughs> yeah, we had no effing idea. No way. Oh, yeah. There's this whole community of people that just love all this old stuff. And now it's like getting this resurgence. Uh, How do y'all feel about that, by the way? Is this weird? Yeah, it's fucking weird. It is weird. It's really weird. (laughs) It's super weird. Like, you know, Eli and I can attest that when we were active, you know, a very small handful of people, like, gave a shit, you know? We were definitely, like, we played out and people came and stuff but it was not you know hundreds of people by any means yeah and i wasn't certainly thinking oh maybe in 15 years some guys are gonna say hey we want to remaster and press breakfast time on vinyl for you and people are gonna buy it and it's gonna sell out (laughs) i would have been like yeah right thanks okay what Uh, so you dropped your first release, uh, which is your demo in 2004. I'm assuming you guys are working on it for a bit before then. Take us back to that time. How did you get the ball rolling? How did this all start? Uh, so Joe was our second singer. So he came in 2005. I didn't know that, by the way. Before yes, I was yes. like looking into this, I always thought that you were the only singer. And so it's wild hearing that somebody else is actually on it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I guess Eli will tell his version of this, and then I'll tell my version of it. Yeah. So, uh, band started, um, 
January of 2002. Um, or no, sorry, January of 2003. And I was connected to Kevin, the guitar player, through a mutual friend of ours that I had gone to high school with. Uh, I was in college at the time. And they were Kevin and his uh, band members, who was a singer and singer named Josh and bass player Ryan, they were looking for a new drummer to start a new band. Uh, and I lived in a the town next to them. And so when I came home to my parents' house for winter break from college in Philadelphia, I met them and started jamming and we uh, hit it off pretty quickly and started writing songs. Um, <clears throat> and eventually had enough songs to start playing local shows. Our first show was in a friend's backyard and uh yeah, I guess just started getting a buzz and we're like just trying to play as much as we could. We played a lot at um, Bloomfield Ave Cafe in uh, Montclair, um, where I think we got a lot of exposure because we were able to, we got added to bills with other bands. Like we opened for Between the Baird and Me when they were, they were on the Silent Circus tour. Uh, what state were you all located and- in? We were in New Jersey. New Jersey, that's right. <clears throat> yeah. How old were you guys at the time? I guess college age? Yeah, yeah, I was 19. Early 20s. 20. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, yeah, things things went were going well with the band for a while. We did a couple tours, like, out to the Midwest and down south a little bit. Uh, we started recording the music for what became Breakfast Time and got all of the instruments recorded. And then we started having some issues, personal struggles, things with our first singer. Recording wasn't going well, tensions were building, blah, blah, blah. Um, That sucks, man. The whole thing went on pause. We went looking for another singer. It took us 11 months to find Joe. And so in that 11 months, we were feeling pretty low. Like we had a buzz rolling and there was like a new label that someone was starting that, and he was like, we had, we signed with them. They're called Venge records. They didn't last very long, (laughs) but they had put out like one or two other albums before, before they wanted to do us. Um, And then we never finished the record because of our singer issue. And then it took us 11 months to find Joe. And then uh, eventually when he joined, we as quickly as possible recorded the vocals for breakfast time to have it finished ready in time to send to disc makers to print CDs to take on the tour that summer that was already booked. And if we didn't have CDs to bring with us on a tour all the way to California and back, then like what the fuck are we doing that for so yeah, true, true. we we made it happen with <laughs> like like maybe two days to spare as far as like deadlines to get things in order um nice i'm glad you got all together. close to the wire <clears throat> now joe tell your version so my version is a little different because i had actually like um played in other bands and I came from a background of like vocal jazz performance and stuff like that. And, um, I wasn't ever screaming in bands ever. And I was just like a fan of music and at the time. And I remember like going to local shows in my area and seeing knife, the glitter play with their other singer and being like, who the fuck is this band? How have I never seen this band? I've never even heard of these guys and they live only like a couple towns away from me. So I remember like leaving and be like, wow, that band was so good, you know? And then like, I don't know, maybe a year or so went by and they were like, Hey, they're auditioning a new vocalist. And I was like, well, I, I think I could do this, you know? And my friends were like talking to me and they said like, like, dude, what the fuck are you doing, man? Like, this is not anything like you've done before whatever. I was like, well, I'm just going to try it. So like I went and I met up with them. I remember, and they were, 
kind of I met up with them at the uh, I guess they lived uh, they practiced in a town that was like on the outskirts of New Jersey and, Pen and Pennsylvania in the woods in in the shed. So like I went out <laughs> to to meet with them and they were just kind of like uh, looking around and being like, OK, well, I think they thought I was like kind of boring. You know what I mean? I was like real quiet and fucking, you know, looking at my feet and shit. And um, I remember they were Eli was like, hey, man, do you know how to do you know how, how time signatures work? Do you know, like I'm going to do like five in and we'll go into this song. And I'm like, yeah, man, I got it. I remember we started playing and everybody was kind of looking around like, holy shit, like this is fucking working. And uh, then they like for a little while they were like, OK, well come back again so then they would invite me back and be like you know is this guy like kind of cool and they would you know we talk about like different music we were listening to besides metal and stuff and then finally they asked me to join and i was like yeah sure i'll, I'll see what, what happens and i'm like good here's six songs learn them, you know so uh i learned them and then we started playing shows pretty much right away <clears throat> did you and know Joe wrote his own lyrics like, because we kept the same songs that we had already written with the previous singer, but he had written all of his own lyrics. So we said, Joe, here's the music. You write your own lyrics and make your own patterns. Like, it's it's a blank slate for you to start from now. Oh, we're definitely getting to the lyrics. Uh, Joe, did you know what you were doing going into the band then, if you never screamed in bands before? Not fucking really, dude. I'll be honest <laughs> with you. I did was you, like, just destroy like, uh... your voice trying to do this? No, I didn't like really like destroy it or anything. I guess I was conscious enough with singing. I took like vocal lessons for many years and I guess I was com uh, conscious enough to be like, okay, well, this is what I should be doing just applied in this different way, you know? And then um, I remember like liking different, you know, metal and hardcore throughout the years and just being like, okay, I think I can apply it this way. And then I applied it and they, seemed to like it you know when you know i was uh taken on at the time at first i was kind of like i don't know if, if this is working or whatever this is kind of like the vocalist that i like sounding uh like that i take from or whatever and i wanted to do a lot of things with my voice at the time so it was definitely a challenge everything in this band for the most part was like how can we challenge ourselves and how fucked up can we make things so uh, let's get to uh, some of the stuff that influenced you guys. Um, I can definitely hear a lot of the number 12 sound in y'all. Like, y'all are absolutely influenced by them. Like, you can tell from the bat. Um, what are some of the other ones? I mean, we were starting around the same time as them. So we were adjacent. Oh, I guess that's true. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so we where played, did you from then? We played a lot of shows with them, like, at v in VFW halls and stuff. Um, and developed an early friendship with that band and uh in many d different ways that continues on to today um my biggest influences were dillinger candiria uh Meshuga, you know the usual influences for <laughs> math metal tech metal stuff yeah yeah true um, uh dillinger i can definitely hear a lot of that in your in your voice uh sound too like the the tapping and stuff specifically. Mm -hmm. I mean the Dillinger thing, like they were right from where we were from. There a few towns, and they were constantly; those guys were constantly in the area. So everybody that was involved in that local scene kind of knew one or two guys that played in that band, and you know it definitely bled into that area, and a lot of the stylings from that area for sure. Uh, what vocalist did you take influence from? I mean, I've always been a fan. Like I said, like I love. You know, I love stuff like Dillinger and Cole S and Converge. And I that's it, when I was going through like heavy stuff at that time. That's what I kind of went through. But I listen to a lot of different music and Eli listens to a lot of different music. I think that's what's been our main bond over the years is like how much music we actually try to listen to. That's not just <laughs> metal and hardcore. And, you know, I think the first time I met Eli, we had like a conversation about how good Jamiroquai is and like his new record and like, you know, and that was what was interesting about playing with him in this band too, was like, I always knew like you were going to look at things from outside the box and not just one perspective. Uh, that's what's important in this kind of genre too, just like expanding your horizons. 
Uh, we got Chris Arp in the chat from uh, Psyopus. He's asking. Yo. He tells me to oh. ask Eli about the blow for blow music bot KTG did with Psyopus in the basement in Pittsburgh. Music? I have no idea what, what he's asking about, but uh, if you do, go for it. <laughs> I don't remember that show. <laughs> we did a tour with them, but I don't remember the Pittsburgh show. Uh, battle so is what I, he unfortunately, said. He said battle? Oh, the battle KTG did. Oh, oh, okay. That wasn't that wasn't Pittsburgh, Chris. Um, not you, not you, other Chris, Chris Arp. <laughs> um, we yeah, that was somewhere in down south. That was maybe like South Carolina or something. He says, "Fuck off." Um, it was. <laughs> <laughs> um well anyway no it's funny i was just talking with lee about this um i reconnected with lee fisher who was their drummer at the time um who's now in fawn limbs and i was like hey remember that time okay i believe you chris maybe it was the pittsburgh basement <laughs> i'll i <laughs> um we set up, we were like staying at this person's house and both me and Lee set up our drum sets in opposite corners of the basement and all the other guitar gear and stuff. And so both Knife Glitter and Psyopus were set up and we went back and forth. We played like a dual set, one song and one song back and forth. Oh, it's tight. Um, it was a lot of fun. And then the next morning, me and Chris Arp jammed on Pantera songs. <laughs> he does love Pantera, man. <laughs> <laughs> so what, to go back to the demo, what was it like you guys being like a new band trying to make a demo? I, I, did y'all go to an actual studio or were y'all trying to home record this? The, uh, breakfast time was home recorded. Um, Kevin was, well, I was in... I'm talking about your 2004 demo though. That was also, yeah, that was recorded in a garage on, I don't know what the system was, but it was like when there were digital recording systems, that was just like a big box. Really? It's, it's all enclosed and you can just plug the microphones in and you have like a little LCD screen and I don't know. Dang, do they sound called. good. Both the demo and breakfast time <laughs> sound really good for being recorded at home. Holy crap. Yeah. Ke I mean, Kevin was studying sound engineering at William Patterson University at the time. We did record those songs at one point at the studio at William Patterson, um, but we and we never used those recordings. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the drums for Breakfast Time were recorded in a friend's living room. Um, nice. And yeah. The bass and guitar were recorded wherever, I guess, in the garage that we were pre rehearsing with at the time. And then Joe's vocals were recorded, like, in my parents' basement. <laughs> and, uh, and the practice the sh shed. And the practice shed out in no northwest New Jersey. <laughs> Y'all have mentioned the practice shed a couple times now. D describe this for us so we get a good, good idea of what this looks like. Um, it was basically a shed. Yes. Yeah, like you go to somebody's house and they have like, you know, lumber and they're, you know, like, uh, like, you know, lawnmower and stuff like that. Weed whacker in there. That's where we practiced. Was it, it was, like made to be like somewhat comfortable or was it just like straight up a shed with like the, uh, I mean, it was bigger. It was a little bigger than like the typical backyard <laughs> shed. It was kind of half garage, half shed, like really big shed for lots of, I don't know if there was a garage door or not. I don't even remember. Was it insulated um, or does it get cold as hell out in winter? No, no, it was cold. <laughs> but it was freezing. But the, the previous garage that we practiced in was also not here. We had one of those like natural gas powered or whatever powered like cannon heaters it was like this big thick scary looking like jet engine thing and you turned it on and it's like <laughs> so we would just turn it on for a little while to heat it up and then play again <laughs> uh pizza sushi roll in chat says do the same drum battle now but with fawn limbs and john from that would be a great idea <laughs>
so to to the lyrics so joe your lyrics are like reading a children's book on acid uh i'd like to read an excerpt from uh shardic uh clickety clack sure. monkey on back alden bat rot fill in the gaps tick tock tick tock uh company halt it's not our fault flip flop flip flop copy paste cut and erase seesaw we saw you we're taking all calls and painting the fence feel free at any time to ask questions the time card is punched but we're we're out to lunch fertilizer be still you're part of the landfill merry hearts are what we steal fossilizing a cheap thrill you're itching that rash irrationally rubber was in the sex now it's in the sheets all the maidens and men acting foolish again what the hell are we? Are, yeah, what is this trying to mean? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. So, so it's um, so that song is about um, I volunteered time at uh, nursing homes, and I was uh, helping the elderly, and I would like see them kind of struggling with um, I guess the realization that they're older and they used to be. Uh, you know, looked at in a different light. And these people now kind of walk all over them, take advantage of them and are mean to them at their shel shelters and homes. So I was spending a lot of time doing that. And I started coming up with this uh, wacky kind of idea in my mind of what if I wrote a song about like these people revolting against these people. And that's what that song's about. It's about like, true experiences for me working at this uh nursing home called merry heart i actually say it in the uh the lyrics i say like merry hearts are what we steal and that's a reference to that nursing home so it's like um i never knew this yeah I, yeah all my lyrics are really fucking weird on breakfast i thought shardick was a bear from a book that you so read. that's the reference the reference is shardick is a bear that's from a Stephen King novel called The Dark Tower. And in Dark Tower, Shardik is this bear that's like a huge protector of like, I um, guess, time and space and fucking like it's old, but it's so old that it's deteriorating and it attacks this group, but they're able to escape because it's, it's not what it used to be. And I use that as kind of like this reference of these these people that I was taking care of kind of being in the same light of them not being able to take care of themselves and them thinking that they're one thing and that, that, you know, and they're not that anymore. So that's what the, that song's about. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is there like, that you uh, weren't expecting that answer. <laughs> right. Is there like a, a thread that connects all the songs together or is, are they all like about very different things? Um, all of them are about different things, um, but later stuff that I was writing in Knife the Glitter definitely had themes that ran into other songs. So, mm -hmm. like, to answer your question, Breakfast Time, no, but there's stuff that was never released that, yeah, there were songs that connected and okay. the lyric themes connected. Was there uh, like a lyrical inspiration for this, like another band or a book or something? I guess you're saying Stephen King's book, uh, you know, might have played a little bit of a role in the last song that we were talking about. I mean, most of the stuff, dude, like Stephen King was just something that I was reading at that time. But like a lot of the stuff that I would come up with was just me just writing weird stories. I kind of just I didn't want to be like, you know, I was a weird 20 something year old guy from New Jersey that didn't really have like too many problems you know and i think that the, uh, <laughs> just enough problems the, uh, just enough music, right number. <laughs> the music um at the time i was like you know we're, we were eclectic and strange and doing weird things so i was like i'm not gonna write cookie cutter lyrics i'm gonna do whatever the hell i want and whatever i feel like and that's what i did with knife the glitter as far as writing Honestly, I think they fit really well. Like, even though they're they're out there and it's hard for me to comprehend them, maybe I got, you know, small brain, but uh, like, they, no, they you fit don't. so like, well. A lot of people have come up to me <laughs> and been like, what the fuck are you talking about, dude? For years. So, yeah, none of it It's supposed to be itself. whenever the fuck you want it to. It's so cryptic, you would never think, oh, maybe it's about this nursing home that he worked in. <laughs> Right, right, for sure, for sure. 
<laughs> uh, so how did you guys write songs? How, how, did, how did they get? Uh, how do they go from uh, an idea to the full fleshed out thing? Um, a long, <laughs> slow, uh, democratic process with uh, largely uh, Kevin and Ryan and I writing the music. Um, and I guess when Joe was there, I imagine you would like give us your input about things and we would all talk about it. But sometimes it would just be like the three of us writing and then Joe would come in and add lyrics to it. Um, but I'd say most of the time it was me and Kevin throwing ideas back and forth. Um, like I'd say generally I had, I would give, the rhythmic ideas a lot and then he and i would sort of have a rough harmonic motion maybe if i had a riff in mind but i would never pick up the guitar and like write a riff i would just be like kevin how about something that's sort of like this that goes high here and then i do this and you go low and we would just like talk about it in whatever way we could sometimes i would write a rhythm and like write it up on you know, a big piece of paper on the wall. Like we had a giant notepad on the wall to keep track of our songs because there's lots of changing counting stuff. And, Sounds like you might um, be uh, someone that made a bunch of guitar noises with their mouth. Absolutely. <laughs> that is exactly what I did. <laughs> you know, something like, oh, <laughs> uh, Pizza Sushi Roll in the chat asks, how did uh, Joe's guest vocals on Trophy Scar's second album come about? Um, I had done, I had known the dudes in Trophy Scars for a long time. Not probably as long as Eli. Eli went to school with them. But I knew them just from being a part of the music scene in my area and playing in different bands or whatever. So when I joined Knife the Glitter, they were kind of like invited me up to uh, be a part of that record. And, and uh, I was just like, sure, man, I don't, I don't mind at all. So they sat me down and they were like, this is the song that we want you to sing on. And I went in and I did some, you know, vocals on that and they seemed to like it. And I was like, cool. And those guys are great. We've always kind of been friends and played shows and uh, with them throughout the years. And they're awesome. Hell yeah. Here, here. <laughs> I played in a band in high school with a couple of those guys. Oh yeah. Um, are there uh, recordings but... out there of it? You don't want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> now, now I kind of do, honestly. <laughs> it was new metal. I was playing guitar. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Chris Harp asks, uh, or says that y'all used to tour in an airport shuttle bus that ran off of fast food grease. I kind of remember hearing something about this. I don't know from where, but uh, so yeah, tell us about your airport shuttle. Okay, so this part is the beginning. True. Part of the first half is. Um, <clears throat> this is the beginning of the disaster story. Um, <laughs> we had this uh, five or six week tour booked with a band called the Concubine that were another oh, Jersey sick band. metalcore band that we had played a lot of shows with. Um, and so this was the tour all the way around the country and we needed a vehicle and Ryan found this airport shuttle bus um, that was like red and white. It had a red stripe across it or red, white, and blue. I, I think was a red, white, and blue, Joe. <laughs> it was red, white, and blue from what I remember. <laughs> and, I just remember having a conversation with him and being like, where did you find this thing? And then also I remember being like, hey – is this a diesel engine? And he was like, yeah, but it's not going to be that big of a deal. That was what I remembered about him buying that. And he was Famous like, last oh, words. Right, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? Oh, God. So it was very roomy and comfortable because the seats were around the edge. It was Ooh. not rows of seats like in a van. So we, we on a long drive through Texas, like we – two people could lie on the floor 
and actually fall asleep. Um, nice. But it got like eight miles to the gallon. <laughs> or something. Okay. Yeah, it was horrible. Terrible like that. And so, yeah, we threw a, a whole lot of money into that van to get it to California and back, including breaking down in California and missing a couple shows uh, and hating life for a few days while we waited for a shop to fix our van and we stayed in a hotel uh, and Joe got drunk a lot and said he was going to quit the band a few times. <laughs> this is all true. This is all true. We stayed in a, a hotel and I got drunk and I quit the band in the hotel room about four times. And then, um, I would walk every day. I was so angry because we were stuck in this town where it was like 110 degrees every day. And I remember there was nothing around. It was like this gas station, this motel that we were staying at. And I would walk like 45 minutes to get a burrito. Uh, from the stand, sweat my ass off. That was, that was, I remember these three days vividly. They're burned into my memory. <laughs> 45 minutes is entirely too far to walk for a burrito. That That's the most uh, most egregious part of this. It wasn't that day, man. I was like, fuck this. I got to get out of here. <laughs> yeah. Like, there's a Taco Bell down the road. I'm going to go get that. <laughs> so, uh... There was literally... There was nothing... It was, uh, like, it was like something out of a movie. I remember they were like, the guy that fixes engines comes in on Monday. And we're like, it's Thursday. You know, it was like that type of weird, uh -huh. like Scooby Doo, fan breaks down type shit going on. Yeah, the first, the first town that we broke, that we came to when we were knew something was wrong with the with the bus, um, their Ford dealership had recently burned down, so we had to go to the next town over to find one. <laughs> Jesus, is this like the Death Valley region of California? Kind of sounds like that. Uh, it was it's, southern. It's, uh, con it's not as far down. But it was a little bit inland, yeah. but uh, it was definitely like southern California. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I remember that's a really creepy place. I uh, went on tour with a band. We went through there, and there was like a tree just full of shoes. It's a very, very odd place down there. Very hills have eyes. <laughs> so, uh, Chris, I'm Arp sure. Says, yeah, man. <laughs> Chris Harp says, uh, while Psyopus was on tour with uh, Knife the Glitter, Psyopus would stop at the gas station only to find out that Knife the Glitter had duct taped pornography on the back of our trailer. It was a giant nice. dick. A full page dick pic <laughs> on the back of their trailer. Where'd you even find that? <laughs> uh, gay porn that we found under a bridge in Nashville. <laughs> very specific alrighty <laughs> true story <laughs> and some sailors apparently <laughs> <laughs> we were like walking down the main drag in Nashville and went to the water and we're just hanging out and Ryan's like yo look at this look what I found over here it must have been like just a know, treasure trove of guys. gay porn <laughs> Yeah, some homeless guy's gay porn that he left there, and us assholes went and took it. <laughs> uh, so you, but it was put to good use for many. The gay years porn thing, that. like, a... yeah, it was always used. It was always <laughs> used to make fun of people too. <laughs> we would put it in front of our merchandise, so you had to look at some dude's dong. While like you're buying a shirt or whatever the case may be, it was always put up for odd reasons, and people would always come in and just like look. They wouldn't even buy anything. Sometimes they would just kind of look at the porn and then leave. <laughs> <Be> like... <laughs> yeah, I like looking back on it. I, you know, in some ways, as a older person who's you know gone through all the things that have happened in our wonderful society i think would is anything that we did like eh, we shouldn't have done that and i'm thinking no we were like really just um kind of anti the whole uh being too tough and serious and mm -hmm. since we were like 
goofy and flamboyant live and just always trying to do something that was just out of the norm in that scene that yeah putting some gay porn wherever seems like a really good idea to make a bunch of tough guy hardcore bros uncomfortable <laughs> uh so let's do it <laughs> <laughs> So you ended up self-releasing Breakfast Time. I mean, uh, yeah, he's not wrong. <laughs> uh, you ended up self-releasing Breakfast Time. It seems like it would fit perfectly with like DeBello or 187 Records. Did you guys try to reach out to any labels, or were y'all just deciding to self-release it from the get-go? Um, like, we originally had signed with Venge Records, and then when it took a year to actually finish the record... And that guy um, I, was... We definitely tried to get signed by multiple labels and sent demos out to people. But as Eli was kind of saying, like we did a lot of things that didn't really help our band get signed in the ways of like our attitudes. We kind like of putting just gay didn't porn everywhere. give a shit. And we're always kind of challenged. <laughs> Metal. Right. <laughs> So I think that um, a lot of times people didn't know how to take us sometimes. And I feel like record labels would come to our shows and be like, hey, I heard about this band. And then be like, what the fuck is going on? You know? So, um, yeah, the answer is yes. We definitely sent it out to people, but never really heard too much. Yeah, a lot of people wrote us off just for the name. <laughs> well, let's, let's bring that up because uh, I meant to write that down in my notes, but I totally forgot till just now. Knife the glitter. What? What the heck? Where's that? Where's that come from? Uh, it was an accident. Um, oh, think... we just lost Joe. <laughs> he'll, be <laughs> he'll be back. I think um, maybe it was someone's like college English textbook, um, and. And we were just trying to figure out a name and uh, either Ryan or Josh like misread a sentence when they were just like flipping through pages and saying things and then flipping more. And someone said knife the glitter and I was and then they went on and said something else. And then one of us was like, what? What was the last thing you said? And knife the glitter. Hmm. What do you think of that? That might work. How about we just say that's our band name. And even if we all hate it at some point in the future, it's our band name. And we're deciding that 100% right now. Okay, sure. <laughs> so that was it. <laughs> because we, I like, we didn't even really care. We just wanted to have a name and we're like, yeah, that sounds different and catchy enough, I guess. I don't know. What the fuck is in a name? Who cares? Yeah, yeah, I guess. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Pizza Sushi Roll asks, best homeless person and or cop encounter on tour? Uh, I'll let you think about it. Have, I'll, I'll let you think about it. I don't it. have a good answer for that. <laughs> uh, right. So... You end up releasing um, Breakfast Time, and then uh, you guys just stop. Why, why, why'd the band die? Um, so here's what happened. We, of course, I'm now I'm going to talk about Joe while he's getting. It back is the on. perfect time, man. Like, to talk shit, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so as I said, we took a long time to write songs because of our uh, grueling democratic process and it like needed to get through everyone's filter of this is acceptable i like this part enough to play it every night on tour um and at one point joe just got fed up with uh us taking so long to write and not playing enough shows at the time or just like getting on with finishing this record that we were trying to write. <laughs> and he was like, I got to do something else with my time right now. And we knew it was coming. And we were like, if Joe quits, let's just be instrumental and not try to find another singer. And so that 
day came. Um, and so we continued. Hey, um, Joe's back. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, hey. you just, you missed it. I this was just talking. This may or may not happen again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, flip your phone sideways. I'm yeah. talking about I don't when you I quit can. the band. I mean, I know I can, yeah. but it might, I might cut out again. I'm going to oh, try okay. real hard. Okay. okay. We were just so talking right, about why good. the band right. died. What were you saying? We were just talking so, about why here. the band died. Let, let me, let's get, so Joe, I talk, I said like our perspective of thinking, yeah, Joe's probably going to quit soon because we're taking so long to finish writing all these songs that we're trying to write for an album and not doing enough other things. You tell your story, your side. Oh, oh, that's where, wow, I missed a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, me, me exiting um, the band basically happened because, um, how do I put this? We, we got off of the disaster and we started working on new material and uh, it was just, we were taking a very, very long time to write material. Um, and at that time, I mean, Eli will tell you, I'm sure, like Eli was driving about two hours to come to practice. Like we were all kind of making sacrifices. It's some more in, in different ways than others. You know, I was working like really shitty jobs and then I was, you know, taking time to do the band on the weekend or whatever and then play out shows. And I was kind of like in this mindset of we need to write and we need to play out and we need to get back on the road and, you know, share these songs with people. And some of the guys were on that page and then other guys were like, well, you know, it's not really that serious or whatever the case may be. Um, and I think at that time I kind of was getting very frustrated because we were getting a lot of different opportunities to do cool things with different bands. And we just kind of were dragging our feet in a lot of ways. And, uh, then at that time, also, uh, Kevin would bought Backroom Studios. So he was very busy with his business at the time. And Eli was actually trying out for Dillinger Escape Plan. And he was, he was like, before they found Billy Reimer, Eli was like, it was between Billy Reimer and Eli. So like, I'm like, I'm working some dumb job. I, I'm, I'm with, you know this guy that just bought a business and my drummer is about to join another fucking band and be on tour. So I just kind of was like, you know what, man? Like, I think, you know, I think I'm done. And then, uh, I, I ended up quitting and we always, you know, all of us always kind of kept in touch or stayed friendly or whatever the case may be. It was no hard feelings. And they just went on and they were great with, with or without me, you know? So, it was always something where, you know, if looking back on things, I was like very young and just kind of like had, my head was in a different place at that time. And part of it was kind of uh, different pressures in my life at that time where I was like, I need to focus on working more and getting my life together. So um, looking back on it, I think that if I – could go back i would have been like hey guys like just call me when you you're done fucking writing the shit and we'll fucking record some stuff but at that time i didn't see it that way i was like fuck this and fuck whatever and i'm done <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah you probably could have not come to practices for a good six months at least and been at and least. then come back and be like <laughs> oh cool you have two songs written <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the band ultimately died though so um, so Joe quit and then we, while we were writing and trying to have enough songs for a full length, um, we started playing shows more as we were like getting closer to having eight or nine songs. Um, and we recorded, we started recording a full length. I recorded all my drums in one day. Ooh, for the knife and glitter Christ. full length. I spent a whole lot of time programming <clears throat> like click tracks that changed time signature and tempos to all of the songs. 
and practicing, having band practice along with the click track. And like, we had played those songs hundreds of times by the time I went into the studio to record it. So um, it felt great. I nailed it. And then it took like two years to finish the guitar and bass tracks. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> You see, you see why, yeah, you see why I tipped out. Blame Kevin. <laughs> Come on, Kevin. <laughs> so, and he's he's not here to defend himself, so we, he can uh, fuck himself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so he had bought backroom, so he was renting out spaces to for practice bands practicing monthly rentals. Uh, he was building a studio, starting to record, um, trying to get his name out as a local recording engineer. Um, so he's spending like all day, every day at the studio working. Um, he's not going to want to spend extra time there by himself to record the guitars for his album. So I we progress was only made on the album when I was able to get up to North Jersey from Philly where I had been the entire time. Um, like my parents lived in North Jersey and I would go back there when I was still living in like student housing. But once I moved into an apartment in Philly and was living there, it was, you know, I would go back whatever weekend I could and spend the whole weekend with Kevin working on it, like me in the producer chair, hitting record and telling him to do that take again. Um, just like little by little, weekend by weekend, um, we would work on it. And, you know, I can't even remember, the guitars took one or two years and then the bass took another year to finish Jesus. after that. Um, for that same reason. At the same time. Be because, I mean, there were, we were like adding some layers to it, changing some parts because we were now instrumental. We're like, okay, maybe we should add a little something here. There's no vocals there. Um, and it just makes sense to like have all the guitars finished before the bass goes on top of it in mm -hmm. case any of those changes were to happen, um, which they did in some songs. And then by the time it was Ryan's turn to record, he had mostly forgotten all of the songs because we hadn't played them live in three years. Um, <laughs> because it got to the point where I said, we cannot play more shows until we finish recording this. This is taking too long. And it took like seven or eight years in the end. So that's why the band. So died. the band never, never, <laughs> y'all never stopped. It just took so long. Wow, I didn't know that. That's interesting. <laughs> so we, um, yeah, like we did a tour with Dillinger. They were playing Bonnaroo in 2008, I think, or nine, maybe 2009. Uh, and so we did that tour with them to Bonnaroo and back. It was us and Dillinger and number 12. Um, God damn, that's a lineup. Holy crap. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. We were on the bus with Dillinger because Kevin was guitar teching for them before he became their guitarist. <laughs> and Ryan was doing their merch. Um, so we were like part of their crew and also the opening act. Um, and yeah, we played like a few more shows after that tour. We played number 12's last show before like they originally broke up and then eventually <laughs> returned um, as so many bands do. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we like just stopped taking new shows because the focus was finishing the album. Well, so then, these shows you're playing, are you playing the instrumental stuff or are you playing like breakfast time, but instrumental? You know what I'm saying? We didn't play any breakfast time songs. So nobody had any idea what the hell y'all were playing, like what the what these songs are from. Yeah. <laughs> Makes sense you don't know breakfast um, time for the even like when I was in the band, it was we got back from that tour and we just started working on new that new material. And we were like, we're not playing anything off of breakfast time anymore. It's all gonna be new songs. 
And because those songs were a few years old at that point. And he's yeah. gone. Oh, he's he's still here. Hey, oh, may, maybe yeah. you're right. Maybe flip your phone the other way. And no, I'm uh, still here. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know why it would make any difference. Yeah, maybe. maybe we'll see. We'll see. Sorry, folks. <laughs> fucking shit up here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, we, were pl- we were playing these new songs, and people were like, hey, are you going to play this? And I'd be like, yep, sure. And then we would play none of that shit, you know? <laughs> and they'd be like, what the fuck? Why aren't you playing any of these songs? Well, why wouldn't y'all? I, I guess you just get tired of it. But I mean, this we is were like, ready to play the new stuff, for, right? We're psyched about the new stuff. We play what we want. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, y'all weren't worried that uh, people would be like wanting to hear y'all the stuff from Breakfast Time. Okay. Okay. Hey. Yeah. Do you? yeah. We were kind of like <laughs> anti everything. It was like yeah. whatever whatever you told us to do, we would do the exact opposite all the time. <laughs> That's kind of was like the ongoing joke in Knife the Glitter was we're going to do whatever the fuck we want whenever we want, and for better or worse. <clears throat> so what if someone came up to you and was saying, hey, don't play anything from breakfast time. Would you be, like, obligated then to play something from breakfast time? I suppose not. Yeah, it's I, funny I that it. you say that. I saw um, the minor times once, and – they would do that when they put out when they had a new record they would only play songs from the new record and they never went back and played songs from previous records and i was watching them and like some people were yelling out old song titles and brandon the singer was like you can't tell me what to do and then i shouted out play a new song (laughs) they had to do what i had to tell them to do (laughs) that's my story uh, Sitai Kodo in chat says, "Awake at 4 a.m. to say that Ivan and I love you guys." Cheers. I don't know if you know them or not, but her and I, or them Thank and you. Ivan say, say cheers. <laughs> Thanks. Cheers. Cheers to you. So the the sound of the band changed dramatically whenever you became like instrumental. Like, it was much more prog and not like <clears throat> uh, not as intense. Uh, why why the big change, the big shift? I guess it was like, what, I, like eight years or whatever, but... Uh. Yeah, I mean, it was our shifting uh, tastes and discovering new music. Like, I was um, studying, I was t- getting my jazz performance bachelor's degree. Uh, and so I was like, you know, being exposed and taking in all sorts of non-metal styles um and just getting into more prog stuff and getting tired of breakdowns and blast beats um nobody gets tired of breakdown breakdowns and blast beats come on (laughs) i don't get tired of blast beats i get i did definitely get tired of breakdowns and didn't really care for them anymore although Maybe I shouldn't say that because this is not the crowd to be saying that to. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, it's wanting to write more groove kind of parts just because that's just what was coming out of us and uh, wanting to just explore more harmonic melodic territory in the guitars but still make it heavy and intense like it's not as grindy and chaotic but um still a whole lot going on yeah uh pizza sushi will ask how did joe feel about the self-titled album's material without him um well it was something at the time that it came out you got to remember the self-titled we had been working on that stuff for a while and I had vocals for maybe, I would say maybe half the songs that are on the, the self-titled record. And um, when I quit, that record didn't come out for another like six or seven years. So at that point, a lot of life happened. And um, <laughs> when it did come out, I know Eli and I actually got together um, and I was at his apartment and he kind of was like, hey, man, um, I just want to let you know, like these songs are going to be coming out. And uh, I was like, cool, man. I hope I hope that things, uh, you know, people want to hear it. I think the songs are good 
just, you know, just as good when I was in them and when years later. So like, I'm happy that it finally got to see the light of day. It kind of put, you know, closed the book on that chapter. I always felt even when I wasn't in that band and even after my years of playing in bands and working in the music industry, I always felt like it was a shame that no one ever got to really hear those songs in a professional uh, mean, you know, through a label or on, you know, any type of uh, like release. So I was glad when it happened. I was happy for those dudes and you know, it was, I'm sure Eli and the rest of the guys felt the same way. It's a huge relief. That was like a giant boulder that I was pushing up a hill for eight years. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine, man. It must have been a really intense for a while. Um, Pizza Sushiro also asks, after Eli didn't join Dillinger, is that when he decided to do his intensest project? You are involved exactly. in a bunch of other projects, but yeah. So Intensus, you even signed like Metal Blade and stuff, which is awesome, man. Like a one man, like one, you're one man band, right? Is what Intensus yeah. is. That's insane, yeah. dude. Gives me some hope that hopefully someday, you know, I, you know <laughs> one man band yeah. can make it on there again. That's crazy. So, well, here's so that is that uh, question is that assumption is exactly right. Um, once I had learned 10 Dillinger songs and then not made the band, but still got to go on tour with them with my own band. So that was still cool. Um, I was in top shape drumming wise. I was playing better, harder, faster than I had ever played before. Um, I like having to learn those songs allowed me to get over a wall in my playing that I had felt for years. Um, and so simultaneously with Knife the Glitter happening, I'm starting to play in other bands in Philly, uh, more experimental stuff. Um, also having the jazz background that I had at that point finished school. Um, I was doing a lot of gigs around Philly in the experimental avant-garde free improvisation scene, which there is in a city. Um, and I wanted to bring the intensity of extreme metal with the intensity of improv sets that I figured probably the vast majority of metal fans have no exposure to free improv where it's this like world of music that's on the fringes of jazz and classical. Um, some of the players come from the classical world and some come from the jazz world and they're using the techniques that they learned from their traditional music educations, but then pushing it to the limits and exploring um, musical possibilities that are not really within either genre of classical or jazz and just like playing and figuring out what to do in every moment. And there would be moments of tension, at least when I was playing, because I brought a metal attitude to these improv shows. And so I'd have these moments where I'm playing with like a violinist and an upright bassist. And I'm like, this is fucking intense. I can do this in metal somehow. I must merge the two. And so I did, I improvised the drum tracks for Intensus start to finish in one take. I just played. Um, that's wild. <laughs> and, I, and I could play the way that I did because I had just learned 10 Dillinger songs. Um, and I took a year or two to record the guitars and drums. I wrote those on top of the improvised drum tracks, just like section by section, wrote and recorded simultaneously. Awesome. Um <laughs> And I was doing, I was recording the Intensus record at from like midnight to 4 a.m. on Friday and Saturday nights after having Knife the Glitter practice or working on the Knife the Glitter album. <laughs> okay. And uh, and 
I did all the music. I knew I wanted extreme screaming vocals, which I didn't think that I could do. And I was like, how can I get some, a little like recognition for this project? Cause like who the fuck knows who I am. Um, but Knife the Glitter had played with Between the Barrett and Me, A Life Once Lost, um, East of the Wall, Number 12, Trophy Scars, bands that have their own followings, some of which are much larger than ours. Um, and so I called in a whole bunch of favors and asked that, hey, I'm doing this project. Uh, you want to sing on two songs for it? You can do whatever you want just be as intense as possible. And all the singers that did it from all of those bands and a few others were totally into it and brought that record to a level that I couldn't have really imagined that it would have been. And Tommy Rogers from Between the Baird and Me was really psyched on it. He had said, um, he was like, I was looking for like, some other kind of creative outlet right at that time. So he was psyched to record two songs for me and between the Baird and me and his solo project had just signed to metal blade. Nothing had come out yet, but they were signed and there was a Tommy solo record. And then the parallax, some the first EP of theirs that yeah, I, I forget remember. what the title. Uh, yeah. Was. I remember parallax. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was their first Metal Blade release. So that was like a year prior to that. They had already signed the deal and Tommy had talked to the, um, not Brian Slagle, um, the guy like right below him. Um, and it was like, I did this project that I think is pretty cool. Check it out. And like sent him a couple tracks. And that guy, Mike Faley, called me up and was like, so I trust Tommy's opinion. And he says that this project is pretty cool and we want to put out your record. And I'm like sitting in Kevin's <laughs> kitchen, <That's sick. laughs> like, yo, <laughs> and that's how it happened. <laughs> that's awesome, man. Holy crap. Is, uh, I know you were in normal people, which got released by Ugg explode, uh, which is owned by weasel Walter. We actually, I actually interviewed him not too long ago. Did you, is that how you got connected with him and with, with that band is going and doing the improv sets and stuff? Yeah. So normal love was a Philly based band that, um, I joined the, one of the guitarists I went to school with temple university. Um, and he had been like pulled into this new project that someone was doing. And he said, I, I know this drummer who's a metal drummer, but he's in jazz school. He might be the exact guy that you're looking for. Um, and he uh, gave me a score because that's what normal love read. Everything that we played really? was, was composed by one member like we each wrote one or two pieces um for the group and Fancy. practiced it like a classical uh chamber ensemble um huh. but we were playing basement shows warehouse shows with like noise bands and punk bands and we were loud and abrasive but we were playing this like super heady complex you know like avant-garde classical shit but also sometimes with blast beats <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome man that's wild uh so cricket slams asked y'all like cheesecake and pizza sushi roll roll says in other words do you knife the cheesecake yes <laughs> yeah so you all can the above for sure <laughs> well what are, what are y'all's favorites Pumpkin cheesecake. Ew. Come on. <laughs> this interview's over now, man. Like, geez, I'm more of like a classic like <laughs> strawberry cheesecake guy. There we go. Joe knows what's but up. Then, but then Cheesecake Factory has that like banana cream one. And I usually get like chocolate syrup and pour it on top of that. Huh, <laughs> I don't think I've ever had banana yeah. cream uh, uh, cheesecake. But uh, it sounds interesting. I, I like you, the... Uh, you haven't left your... I like the uh, Snickers one that they do, man. That the peanut butter with like the caramel stuff. Oh my god, that's what's up. 
So last month, that's, yeah, that sounds like it's what's up. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the the banana cream man is you're not living life until you do it. I guess I gotta try it now. Um, <laughs> Cricket Slams actually yeah, says sure. that he wants he wants to try it out too. Um, so last month you guys actually got this uh, got breakfast time remastered and re released on uh, Secret Swarm Records. What was that like? Uh, Fifteen years after after it came out. kind of a trip um, <laughs> that people cared enough about that EP that we released 15 years ago to, uh, yeah, to put it on vinyl and get the whole art redone and all the fancy stuff that's been done to it. I, it's uh, flattering. Um, and it's kind of, it's fun to, go back a little bit and the remast the remaster from Jamie King um, Jamie King sounds great it sounds certainly better than the original <laughs> what are your thoughts yeah. Joe yeah for sure I mean I kind of it kind of got thrown into my lap I like woke up one morning and I didn't know any of it was happening or going on that Eli had been talking to people and he's like hey check it out man and I was like I was waking up, man. I was like getting ready to go to work. And I was like, what the fuck is going on right now? You know? And we started laughing. I started laughing about it because we, you know, no one like Eli and I have talked about like nobody, nobody's gave a shit for a long time. And it's really flattering to see people that were like, Hey, we want to, you know, this means a lot. And we want to like rework the artwork and put out this record for you. And then it, it, sold out immediately and you know we're just we're all just kind of taken back <laughs> were y'all have y'all been involved in the math course scene this whole time or was this like you the first time that you realized that it was still a thing outside of Dillinger, Joe, obviously. <laughs> yeah i mean like we haven't thought about it you know like it ha it was something that kind of we did and we went on with our lives and we've always been really involved in the music scene before and after Knife the Glitter, and we'll continue to be that, but we just thought it was kind of like something that was, you know, we did, and that was that. Oh, no, you know, I mean the account. genre as a and whole, people, that, like, mathcore existed, like, outside of Dillinger. Were you all still aware that it was a genre that existed, or were you all just like, you know, that was a fad that happened? Yeah, like, yeah, like I mean, we're very... Ago. Yeah, I mean, for sure, we're very in tune with bands that do like have Matthew records or whatever the case may be. I think Eli and I constantly like we lived in the same city for many years and we would constantly bump, go to shows together and check out new bands and check out new material. So we were always on up on, you know, what's new in every scene, especially with metal. You uh, were sure. telling me that you were working and then I at, worked at a relapse for a while. Yeah, I used to work for Relapse, so I mean, every day, man, I was listening to new bands and new genres and working with that team and trying to figure out what the next thing was. And and my job there was I worked with bands, particularly on making sure that they were set up for uh, with their credit lines and making sure they had what they needed before they went out on tours. So, you know, I got some experience doing that in Knife the Glitter, being out on tour and knowing what it's like to you know, have your van break down in the middle of the desert and, uh, you know, have things that go wrong all the time. So I guess I was the guy for the job. <laughs> uh, so on that note, let's talk about a couple of shows. Um, what was y'all's best show? Eli, you want to go first? <clears throat> um, I'm going to go way back to before Joe's time when we had a costume show. Um, I think Joe, you were at that show, right? Did I you? Was. Yeah. Um, it was like our homecoming from one of the tours that we did uh, with our first singer and local show. And it was advertised. This is a costume show. Wear a costume. Um, and it was packed and everyone was in costumes and it was just a really fun Did y'all wear atmosphere. costumes? Yeah. What was yours? Uh, I think I had, I shaved my beard. So I had like 
crazy like Lenny sideburns. Uh, <laughs> and I had a Slayer Divine Intervention shirt that I uh, made it like a belly shirt and sleeveless. And then I had <laughs> nice. uh, jeans that I made like short shorts. Um, <laughs> and that was my costume. Um <laughs> I can totally picture I, this in my head, by the way. There's, <laughs> I think, I think, <laughs> I think that's the one. We, that was not the only time we played in costume. There was definitely another time where I wore like a little pink dress. Um, <laughs> and like Ryan wore a leotard. Kevin wore a Tigger costume at one show. Um, that must be hot to play in. Like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always sweating like crazy in that. Joe, what were you Your wearing turn, at that Joe. show? There was a show that I was – so that costume party was before – that show he's talking about was before I was in the band, and I remember I just showed up in my normal street clothes, and I remember getting oh. a lot of shit for showing up in my street clothes. <laughs> as, as you said. They're like, this is a costume. And I was like, fuck you. I'm coming in and watching these bands. Um, I do remember dressing up. There was another show that we played right before Disaster started. Kevin – Kevin's father used to run this like haunted house around Halloween time out of his uh, parents' garage. They would make it into a haunted house and kids would enter. And he had all these like Halloween costumes that were lying around. And he had this eight man costume, I remember. And the eight man costume didn't fit. Only the legs fit. <laughs> so I decided to take my shirt off and wear the legs <laughs> <laughs> and just have like shirtless and play a show on that. And it was the, one of the worst ideas I've ever done. I can imagine, <laughs> man. <laughs> <laughs> it was, there was fur and all sorts of stuff getting stuck in my throat while I was singing. It was awful. It was a bad idea. <laughs> I think Kevin dressed up at that one. He had like some leather jacket on and no shirt on, which was great. And then I came out looking the way I did. And it, we, we just had a good laugh about it. <laughs> Your shows sound like they're insane. What was the worst show? We just show didn't you... care. <laughs> just didn't care. So just... Worst show? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Worst show. Worst show. Unless you didn't say your best show. Was that your best show? Or No, no, no. My best show, I think... I think my favorite show ever in this in the band was... We played with Between the Barrett and Me in Philadelphia... And I just remember that show. There was so many people going crazy. We played with a lot of good, like we would play with Between the Barrier to Me and Behold the Octopus. And it was just, it was awesome. The place was packed and people were going nuts and having a great time. And that's probably one of my favorite memories for playing in Knife the Glitter. I would say one of the worst shows we ever played was at this Legion Hall in Northern New Jersey um, that like, I remember this gang fight started happening during our set <laughs> and we were just kind of like, they were fucking garbage cans getting thrown across the room and shit. And we're like, kind of <laughs> like, what the fuck is going on? Like, and, and our set, like some dude came up to us at the end. He's like, you guys fucking suck. And we're like <laughs> throwing fucking like garbage cans and shit. And we're like, let's get the fuck out of here. This is awful. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? That's yeah. wild. <laughs> just, just just a typical night of the show, you know. You throw around a couple of trash cans, belittle the artists on stage, you know. That's just a. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was That's very wild. much like it was very much like Rumble in the Bronx, man. There were just people <laughs> fighting, and things were getting thrown across the the, the entire room, and we were just kind of like, w "What is going on?" It was a lot of really tough guy bands. I remember. That, and we were on it for some reason. That happened a lot with our band. We constantly got put on shows where we're like, well, we don't really fit in on this show, but we're just going to play anyway. And I remember that show particularly being like, what, what the fuck? Let's, get, <laughs> let's just go. Is there footage <laughs> of that? I don't think so, man. Probably not. <laughs> if there is, just please let me know. If anybody has that, please let me know, because I'd love to see it now. <laughs> I imagine you guys get probably get mismatched on bills a lot because like y'all are so original. There's not a lot of bands to actually you know compare you guys to. 
during that time, it was a lot of just a lot of weird bands, you know, and we would play these shows that had like 15 bands on them. And we're like, what, what time are we going on guys? You know? (laughs) Yeah. But we played, we played a lot of those, man. And, um, you know, we would go and stay there for the whole thing and just be like, okay, cool. It's 11 o'clock at night. Now we're going to go on. I remember there was one show we went on at like one 30 in the morning. Jesus. (laughs) that was out in new york state and we're like well there's two people here what is the point (laughs) did y'all have to pay to play like sell tickets and shit we were very very against that hell yeah never paid to play yeah we didn't do that we were very much like we don't we'll never fall for that yeah it was complete bullshit man uh so eli your worst we're also very lucky that we had like a a scene where we would just be like, okay, we're just going to run out of VFW hall or whatever the case may be. And we'll put on our own stuff or whatever. Like we came from this cool community in New Jersey that kind of, you know, did whatever they could. And there was a bunch of weird bands from that area and people just kind of helped each other. Hell yeah, man. Keep it DIY. Look. So, uh, Eli, sure. worst show. Um, I'm going to say that the worst show was Myrtle Beach, where there wasn't actually a show to play, but there was supposed to be a show. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> and instead of playing a show in Myrtle Beach, we got horrifically sunburned in Myrtle Beach. <laughs> Wait, so you thought there was a show that was supposed to happen? We, we had booked a show with a guy who had booked the show at a venue and when we showed up to the venue the one guy there was like there's no show books here <laughs> <laughs> and when we're trying to get a hold of the you know the booker he was MIA um so instead That's we're sad. like let's go to the beach let's let's just go to the beach it'll be fun and we had we thought we were having a great time and then uh, Later that day, we had boils on our back, and Ugh. it was like That's the worse. most painful two nights of sleep. We're like cutting open uh, vitamin E pills and like rubbing it on each other's back to try and soothe <laughs> the pain. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's a thing. Is it that was a thing? really bad. Both of us got really. <laughs> it definitely was on that trip, man. Like we um we got sunburned pretty horrifically and i remember that was the worst i remember playing <laughs> and the the sores would like open while i was playing oh. and they would pus through my shirt oh. and i was i remember i was in so much pain and then i remember i once it healed later in the tour i couldn't stop itching i was constantly oh, pulling itching up my the back. skin and like, stuff oh. this is the fucking worst sunburn i've ever had in my life <laughs> Good what times. Was, what was the weirdest place y'all played? Like, so what we've had so far, we've had like a ice cream shop. Um, a band played in front of a bunch of fifth graders at an elementary school. Um, yeah, like barn shows. I think shows the strangest stuff. place that I remember is we played in Cincinnati at this place. I'll never forget this. We played at this place. It was called Sudsy Malone's. Okay, and it the was a bar, the bar, but it was a laundromat. Yeah, and I remember. Okay, <laughs> and I remember. Um, Veil of Maya play played with? the show. Veil of well. Maya. Yeah, I knew. I was like, that was a band that then like got kind of big, but they were brand new at the time. Right, right. So I remember playing the show, and I remember vividly watching people do their laundry that had no, like, they were not fans of our band. They were just kind of doing their laundry, watching us play and being like, what the fuck is going on? (laughs) How is this set up? Is it like a laundromat in the front and at the back there's like another room where there's a bar? Or is it like... Other way way around. (laughs) What I remember was like, you walked in and there was a window and the band would play in front of the window. And then right in front. to your left while you were playing was a bar that you could sit down at. Mm-hmm. But then in the back of the venue, it was a fully operational lawn. Downstairs? It was like a lower floor with... It was like a walk down. 
Yeah. <laughs> and literally, I'll never forget this woman like folding clothes and look and like staring at me while I ran around the room like a moron <laughs> and just being like, what is going on? <laughs> <laughs> That's so crazy, dude. Oh, my God. I think you might have won. Uh, what was the place again? Sudsy Malone's? It was oh called Sudsy Malone's in Cincinnati, yeah. Ohio. Sudsy Malone's. I'm writing it down. There, I'm going to see if it's still there. Yeah. I hope you're still doing it. Yeah. Eli, can you top that? <laughs> yeah, that was definitely one of the strange. I don't think I can top that. I also remember playing a show in Michigan at a, it was like, it, how it was set up was strange. It was like a thrift store in the front and then this door opened in the back and there was a whole venue in the back of the thrift store in Michigan. And I remember playing there uh, with the concubine on tour and just being like, I don't know, there wasn't a ton of people. It was maybe like 30 people. But I remember it being very strange. I was like, where are we? We're in the back of this weird store. I didn't even know this was back there. <laughs> but it was cool. Yeah, you, know, you got any weird places you all played? Uh, I mean, we did play in a barn once. Um, I guess I, I guess some people may consider that weird. I thought it was fun. Um, <laughs> Were there animals in the barn? Not that I remember. I don't okay. think so. Uh, but it, Joe, was that? Were you there? I, or was I played that with you? the. I played in a barn. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> in rock, yeah. I yeah. played. It was like I remember it being very cold, but we played yes. in this barn. It was cool. It was cool vibe. It was like playing a basement show. Yeah, but outside in a barn. <laughs> but with hay. <laughs> uh, so. <laughs> How, what was the scene like in uh, New Jersey? Was it like uh, full of mathcore bands or were y'all kind of like beasts of your own? It was pretty varied. Um, every, like the bands that were in our immediate area that we played local shows with over and over again, everyone was a little bit different. Um, there was like some bands that were like a little more screamo, but like like old screamo, not like emo screamo what like the kids think screamo is today <laughs> um and then yeah Isn't i Hayward feel like from new jersey too or were they rhode island i feel like they, they should have been around your area i don't know that band okay oh you don't know hayworth too come on man get on this <laughs> homework tonight um <laughs> <laughs> Uh, were y'all generally accepted in the scene though? Like, did y'all get a lot of crap from hardcore kids? Like, you were saying that one show where someone said you guys sucked. Is that like a common occurrence? Uh, yeah, there were definitely shows that, if it was, you know, if we were further from our local North Jersey scene, um, where there were no bands that had any sense of humor, um, yeah, we definitely had tough guys calling us fags and whatever. Um, and <laughs> Jesus we, Christ. yeah, we didn't care. There was, yeah, there we was, loved. Def- yeah, like there. I'm glad I make you feel uncomfortable because you deserve to. Yeah, now I'm gonna make you feel more uncomfortable. <laughs> it was kind of the idea behind. Like that. we, ha- was- there was a show that we played in South Jersey, and <laughs> yeah, just someone some guy who was not uh you know comfortable with his own sexuality um (laughs) didn't like the way that kevin was moving around him and it like turned into like a full-out brawl (laughs) (laughs) so yeah we were used to that but that was yeah that was kind of an occurrence i think that when we played, it was either you kind of thought it was funny and amusing because we just did whatever we wanted to do. Or if we saw that you were uncomfortable with it, we tried to make you even more uncomfortable. <laughs> I, think that, I think that was kind of the, uh, what we got our, got our rocks off on. Like we, yeah. we would laugh to ourselves. There make was an impression some, one way or another. Yeah. There were definitely times where our – I was threatened to get my ass kicked while playing and uh but it was all in fun. It was all funny and we just made fun of those guys and just didn't care. 
but nothing ever, nothing really ever happened. Nothing really crazy where anybody, any of us got like knocked out or anything. At least not to me while yeah. I was in the band. Well, thank God, man. That would fuck. Uh, so Pizza Sushi Roll asks, what are the right. other members up to? You still like, I'm, I'm assuming y'all stay in contact with them. <clears throat> yeah. Um, Kevin is busy as hell uh, with Backroom Studios, not with Dillinger anymore. He was in Dillinger the last two years of their existence. Uh, but he's got a whole empire at Backroom Studios at that at this point. He's recorded a lot of notable albums and has a whole crew with assistants that are like doing the drum edits and you know. Um so he's quite full with that. Uh, and Ryan is a handyman. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> all right. Okay. All right. <laughs> but Ryan and I text regularly about music. We're always sending each other things that we're discovering that we think the other guy will like. <laughs> all righty. Uh, yeah, guys Ryan's have... great. Even though he doesn't play bass anymore. But he should, because he was good at it. <laughs> yeah, he's great. Come on, Ryan, get back on the base. Um, <laughs> you guys have some merch. Uh, I saw shirts, and you yeah. you actually have these cool prints that I'm actually really interested in. How mm -hmm. do you how do y'all ship those? Do you ship them in like uh, what do you call them? Those uh, a roll. Yeah, yeah. Roll you up. ship them in those. Dude, that's yeah. nice, man. I was I'll thinking about picking one of those up. Over on the other side of this. Room. Getting the house tour gonna... now. Yeah. <laughs> Mathcore cribs here. Um where is it? <laughs> here we go. Um this is the uh last shirt <laughs> that Knife the Blitter <laughs> printed. Nice. I call it Green Nightmare. <laughs> um, it's like a bunch of weird figures and with like falling over block letters that say Knife of Glitter. Um, yeah, so th these were in Ryan's possession for years and um, he's too lazy to uh, really do much with them. So I, I got him to get them to my parents' house and then they brought them up to me in Massachusetts <laughs> so I could organize them all and catalog it and start selling these old shirts that have just been sitting around. Um, and then we also have a whole box full of uh, breakfast time posters. That's sick. Yes. The original artwork. Uh, yes. I've never actually and seen I the send... old lady before. Before I was looking into this, is was that like the back or something? Back with like the song yeah. titles on it? Okay. That's on the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because our friend who did this just did like the whole picture with the intention the whole time of it being wrapped around. Okay. That's fucking sick, guys. Um, and you said that the pressing, the records are sold out, right? Yeah. They're not, they're not repressing that? I don't think so. Okay. So we got a question that I ask everybody here. How do you dress your hot dogs? Naked. Naked. All right. I, I like it. I like it. Just being the basic. It's it's dry, but you know if you can get past that, then eh, okay, okay. It's a juicy hot dog. And then it's a dry bun wrapped around that juicy hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, yeah, Joe? Not not me. I, I'm more like a chili cheese guy. Okay, all right. I like that. You put some onions and stuff on there too. Yeah, definitely onions, jalapenos, chili cheese. Get a couple beers, man. That's it. That's a great hot dog. That's a great deck. <laughs> that sounds good, man. It sounds fucking good. Uh, what was the last album you guys listened to? 
Uh, uh, Joe, the last you know. record, the last record that I've been listening to, um, well, it, I've been listening to this rapper called Benny the Butcher, and uh, <laughs> he put out a new mixtape a few days ago, and I've been absolutely obsessed with it, and it's fantastic. And he's a he's a rapper from Buffalo, New York, and it's just really, really. It harks back to like early '90s gangster rap that I grew up with that I love, and uh, kind of brought into this new, you know, day and age, but with that kind of old sound. So I'm a real big fan of that. And then I bought the new Genghis Tron record, and I've been playing a lot of that as well. Oh yeah, and man! I think it's their best record. Yeah, it's pretty sick. Sure. Honestly, like, I wish they were doing more of, like, the cyber grind kind of stuff. But, you know, eh, what they're doing is cool. Eh, this is a bit different. I personally, yeah, I understand what you're saying. And I get why people like that older stuff. But the first time I heard the new songs off of this record, I was like, wow, this is, like, the best thing they've ever done. And then hearing it I agree. from uh, hearing the whole thing as a whole piece, I was like, man, this is... This is fantastic. So I don't know. I, it, that band is really interesting. I want to see if they keep evolving, which I hope they do. Dapper Dink in the chat's really True excited that. that you like Benny the Butcher. By the way, never heard of him. It's a sick <laughs> name, but Dapper Dink is all about that. Apparently, <laughs> I'm the Butcher coming. <laughs> what about you, Eli? What was the last one you listened to? Uh, I've been listening to Kate Bush lately because of, uh, I, sounds like a country I'm star. A, no, she's, uh, a English eighties, uh, singer songwriter who, uh, was a major influence on, um, artists like Bjork and Joanna Newsom and huh. other kind of like left of center, but still like pop, pop indie okay. stuff. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm in this group on Facebook called Dorkscography. That's um, we like vote on a, an artist's, catalog to listen to and we go through every each day is one album um so that's just like what we're on right now we're on <laughs> okay. Kate Bush. um but that was my suggestion and i had been pushing for her because because <laughs> i am a big fan um the album is called the dreaming joe doesn't really like it we already talked about this um, no we talked but, about it the other day he he messaged me and he was like do you like kate bush i was like not fucking really dude and he was like, <laughs> he was like, but, but what about this record? What about that record? And I was like, yeah, it's not for me, man. Sorry. I was like, uh, I told him, he, I was like, yeah, I get why you like it. I, I said, this record sounds like the talking heads if they were British. You know what I mean? It's kind of got that, <laughs> at least that record had that slint to it. Her later records don't. I like people she's inspired. Like I'm a big St. Vincent fan for, for sure. And like, mm. I think she's very important. But I have tried numerous times to get in her catalog, and I'm just like, okay, just I'll listen to something else. But yeah, I'm I'm gonna throw in two other things because like I listen to I, I listen to like 60 new releases every week, um, at least or sample them at least. Some metal albums that I did listen to today also. Uh, Fractal Generator is a pretty sick tech metal band that I just discovered. And uh, Blindfolded and Led to the Woods. Dude, they're sick. They're so sick. Oh. I I've, saw I've actually got them scheduled for an interview later on. Yeah, weeks. their new record. I was listening to wild. a new Gadget song today. Who, if you're not oh, a I didn't know they were still fan, around. That's awesome. Dude, that band rules. They've always ruled, and they're so underrated. And this new song has Ethan from Primitive Man singing on it. And it's it's great. It's fantastic. If you're into extreme metal or grind at all. Are man, they putting Gadget a new one out? Real. Yeah, I guess they recorded like a split that they're doing. And then they have like four or five new songs. I guess their singer left. And they're getting a bunch of people to kind of just jump on and do vocals to all the songs. 
and the stuff that they're putting out is all it's awesome that's sick they're, they're being just, this they're, tight they're yeah they're awesome they're a great band they've always been a great band what were y'all's album of the year either for last year or this year leading up to this point album of the year last year um i would say Last year, some of my favorites, that Hum record that came out, I was really, really into. Um, I, I love that record. Who was it? Um, hum. Uh, hum? This band called Hum. Oh, Hum. They, yeah. Okay. They put out a record. They were they were a band in the 90s, and they hadn't released anything in over a decade. And they put out this record that just came out of nowhere, and it was like they were just right back doing the same things that they've always been doing. And it's It's one of their best if not their best it's very good um my favorite i i gotta mention two because i just have to um my two favorite records of 2020 i i always go overboard like when i make my year-end list there's like a hundred albums on it um my favorite metal album of last year was azusa which is uh two members of extol the bass player from dillinger um who's my bandmate in john from and uh a female singer um and it is brilliant uh progressive metal with other non-metal elements this the singer she has a really wild range. She can scream bloody murder um, and sing softly and delicate and sing like really strong melodic. She's got a a crazy range and the music is um, intricately wound and so much harmonic density and just so much happening in every moment. And it's completely brilliant to me. Um, <clears throat> that was my favorite metal record of the year. And my other favorite album of the year was by an artist called Namdi, um, N N A M D I Namdi. Um, he's, he's actually the drummer of a math rock band called Monobody. Um, but he has a solo project under his own name. That's like a melding of math rock, R and B, and hip hop, and it'll go from one style to the next, and then right on top of each other within the same song. And there's like a humor to it, but also elements of like intense emotion, and it's all over the place. It's really incredible. Uh, the album is called Brat. I already actually wrote that one down because that sounds good. Uh, chat, we're kind of nearing the end of this. Get out your questions if you got them. Pizza Sushi Roll's got a question. Any plans for another John Frum album? Yes. Um, a second John Frum album is partially written. Uh, we had lots of sessions where we were like recording jams and then... Our guitarist uh, moved to New York and we were starting to send files. Like he would send me a bunch of riffs and I would arrange it and like write drums to it or I'd record a bunch of different drum patterns and send it to him and he would arrange it and write riffs to it. Um, So the plans have been slowly moving. Um, I am up in Massachusetts now. I moved here a few months ago with my family for a number of reasons and Um, I've kind of got a lot of stuff on my plate right now with my family and the other guys, the guitarist is in New York. Liam bass player is in Philly. Derek singer is in California. Um, the album is going to be finished sometime this year with Kenny Grahalski on drums from Imperial Triumphant and um, Simulacrum, which is the John Zorn project. 
um, that Matt, our guitarist, is also in. Um, we so had a conversation. So I'm not going to play it because I, I can't – right now, I, with what's going on in my life, I can't commit to being somewhere else for a long enough time to record an album. Mm. Um, and I, I don't want that to hold – hold it back and I can't really tour much right now with young kids and uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, so yes, I won't be playing on the second album, even though I helped write most of the songs. Um, the goal is to come back into the fold after the second album and Hopefully things are still moving and I can rejoin for a third album and get back to business. Ready. Uh Joe, what you been up to, man? You got anything you wanted to plug? Uh no man. I could just tell you a little bit, like like I said, after um after Knife the Glitter, like I spent many years working in the music industry and I quit my job a few years ago. And I started working to become a sommelier. So uh, for people that don't know what that is, it's a wine steward or a wine expert. And I'm trudging to that. I do write for a wine metal inspired zine out of Oregon called Blood of Gods. So if you like metal music and you like wine or are interested in it, check them out. All the proceeds go to help animals in the area of Washington state. Do you like uh, recommend wines that go with specific bands? Yeah, dude. I, Do so you really? That's awesome. That I, <laughs> yeah. Thanks. So the last <laughs> issue I, I, I uh, contributed to, we did, I guess, 25 pairings of wine with different classic metal records. So, <laughs> uh, crazy. You know, like, you know, Neurosis and like Amorphous and like all these classic metal releases. And there's like a little blurb that I wrote that's written about the pairing that I have with it and why it matches or whatever the case may be. But you yeah, got to send that to me. What it looks like. Yeah. Uh, what the heck? I like, see yeah, that. they have like an Instagram and all that. But they have I didn't even know he was doing now. this. Here, I'll show you. Yeah. So <laughs> this is this is the latest issue. Uh, Blood of Gods. Um, like I said, all the proceeds go to animal shelters in Washington state. And then this is the first one. There's a new issue coming out soon. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I contributed a little bit to the new issue, uh, with some funny, funny kind of, uh, pairings in that as well. So I don't know what, maybe it's something that will keep happening. Maybe it won't, but for right now it's fun. That's pretty awesome, man. I didn't know that you could even really do that. that that's really cool. I like that. Um, speaking of yeah, like... Yeah, wine is something that... No, you're good. You're good. You're good. I'm sorry. You were saying? No, you're good. You're good. You're good. No, wine is kind of something that a lot of metalheads don't really get into or they get into later. Um, I was lucky that I always kind of had an interest for it working in the restaurant industry for many, many years. I just started to learn more and more and was... You know, closet. Uh, I was fa very fascinated about it, but I kept it to myself. You know, a lot of metal dudes are, you go to show and they're drinking Paps Blue Ribbon or whatever the case may be. Um, and we're kind of, you know, heavy music and wine is something that goes together really, really well, especially if you're into black metal or darker uh, styles of music. So we're trying to bridge that gap slowly. We'll see what happens. That's as really time interesting. Goes on. I really like that. Um, speaking of <laughs> blogs and such, uh, yeah, Eli, you have one too, right? Eli twin.com. You, uh, Eli you post Oh, sorry. I, I see there, there is twin in the name. So I see twin and I say that. Um, but anyway, you, uh, <laughs> you post reviews and such, uh, what, what's your website about? Yeah. Um, well, my website is currently down, <laughs> yeah, it's so you right can't now. visit it, <laughs> but I need, <laughs> Once I get that figured out, which I realized a week or two ago, um, yeah, my my website is since I've been in so many different projects and have also put out my own solo music. It's just 
place to put it all in one place. Um, and then about a year or a little year and a half ago, maybe, um, I started a blog, um, just writing reviews. It's something that I had thought about for a long time since I'm like really passionate about discovering new music constantly, like every week on new release Friday, I save, you know, like 40 to 80 albums into my library and sample them over the course of that week and then uh, decide what stays. And so I was writing 10, 10, 15, 20 (laughs) album reviews a week (laughs) for a little while. (laughs) I don't know how I did that. I definitely can't keep that up now since my second child was born. Um, But I was keeping up with it pretty well until that point. Um, There's not a whole, I'm not doing a whole lot on it now. Uh, I did a year in review because I had like a hundred albums in like seven different categories. Um, So that was the last big blog post that I did. And I made playlists and all sorts of stuff. Um, but yeah, hopefully that website is back up online soon. I'll get on that tomorrow. <laughs> well, that's about all I had to talk about. Uh, you guys have something else you want to bring up or are you ready to go to the outro? Yeah, we're good. All righty. Uh, if yeah, you're we're listen- good. Just thank you for having us. Oh, uh, absolutely. You guys are always welcome. Um, I, if you're thank listening you. to this podcast, I probably don't need to tell you to listen to knife, the glitter, uh, if, if you haven't listened to them, you need to step back and seriously re- reevaluate your life decisions. But if you haven't, check them out. Um, you're on uh, all the streaming platforms. you got a Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Bandcamp for Knife the Glitter. Uh, you can find more music from Ellie at, uh, by checking Eli. out. Eli. Oh, my God. Okay, people here listening to the podcast, it's because Ellie from Fawn Limbs, I saw his name first, and I always thought E-L-I is pronounced Ellie, so there we go. Um, but anyway, Eli is also involved in John Frum, Intensus, Normal Love, and a bunch of other uh, bands you should uh, you should be checking out. Um, you can find all this stuff at uh, Eli uh, EliLitwin.com. I don't know why it's so hard for me, man. EliLitwin.com. Um, Joe, uh, you can also check out Blood of Gods. Which is which sounds awesome, man. Like for real, it sounds great. Um, and uh, yeah, y'all have any other things y'all wanted to plug real quick? No, nah, man. We're all good. Not really. All right. Yeah. As for me, drop my channel follow so you always know when I go live. You can also sub to get access to the interviews before they hit YouTube and streaming services, as well as some exclusive emotes. You can also uh, subscribe for free by attaching your Amazon uh, Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account. Um, find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. YouTube folks, if you enjoyed this, please drop a like, click the notification bell. Don't forget to subscribe. It's a great way to support me for free. Check out my music, The Sound That Ends Creation, at thesoundthatendscreation.bandcamp.com. Uh, my next guest is California-based tech death band Ominous Ruin, who dropped a new album through Willow Tip Records back in February. Join us this Sunday the 4th at 7 p.m. Central, right here at twitch.tv slash the cast ends creation for the live cast. Thanks for being here, guys. Hope you had a good time. Thanks again, man. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Hell yeah. And thank you guys for watching and listening.